I'm going to talk mainly about uh, some potential complications of radio surgery, but I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Uh, you know, certainly, as Dr. Gertzen has very uh, explained very well, radio surgery really is a powerful uh, tool in our armamentarium to treat really an oncologically very, in most cases, a very difficult uh, condition, which is uh, metastatic spine disease. Um, but I thought I would start uh, by uh, disclosing a really odd hobby which I've developed, which is watching documentaries about airplane disasters. As we all fly out, you, you might think that's a very, and my wife thinks it's a very strange thing for someone who, I mean, all, most of the faculty here, we travel a lot. I've just been fascinated, I think, by the whole investigative process of figuring out what went wrong and learning a lesson, applying that lesson, and it makes air travel for us much, much safer. So actually, instead of being more frightened of air travel, I'm much more uh, reassured that it's very, very safe. And so that's, with that in mind, um, I w and I'd like to talk a, a little bit about the potential complications of radio surgery. So here's a very interesting incident that happened in Canada in 1983. Air Canada had, had, was, well, first of all, in 1983, right around this time in Canada, they were switching from the imperial system of gallons, miles, to the metric system of kilometers and kilograms. And in fact, it was very controversial in Canada. People were, you know, up in arms, demonstrations, signboards, you know, no metric system, et cetera, et cetera. So you might imagine it was quite an upheaval in, the Canadian, in Canadian society. And Air Canada at this time had taken delivery as very first metric airplane, the Boeing 767. And so this was their first metric airplane in their entire fleet. And what happened was about 41,000 feet uh, on a flight from Toronto to Edmonton, about halfway through, which is in uh, a little uh, east of Winnipeg, Manitoba, the plane completely ran out of fuel. That, without fuel, no engines, all their systems shut down. They're running on, their radio was on an emergency battery, but everything shut down. And, um, and fortunately, the pilot had a hobby as a glider pilot and knew of an, uh, and, could, and could fly gliders. And they were near an abandoned uh, Air Force base in Gimli, Manitoba, and managed to land without any engine power at all, minimal hydraulics, uh, and, uh, and all on board uh, were safe. And there were really no serious injuries. It was really a, a spectacular miracle and one of the greatest feats of aviation in Canadian history. And, not, and in fact, uh, this uh, airplane is famous. Uh, this Boeing 767 is called the Gimli. Uh, and, and for sale, by the way, I just found. And you can get it for half a million dollars, a real deal. <laughs> Anyways, so they go into the investigation to try to figure out what went wrong. Why did this aircraft uh, fly without enough fuel. Well, the, 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 the problem was they were transitioning from the, met, from the imperial system of gallons to kilograms. And in their calculations, they actually going f made a mistake and did a calculation for, uh, for pounds and ended up only putting in about half of the fuel that they needed for the flight. And so it ran out of fuel halfway uh, across uh, Canada. They took on uh, really 49,000 liters instead of the 20,000 liters that was required uh, because they did have some fuel in the fuel tank. And so fortunately, no one, was, uh, no one had died, but a very, a, a very small detail led to what potentially could have been an absolute catastrophe. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about this morning is that it's critical to pay attention to the details. I'm going to give you one case, again in full disclosure, not my case, but it did happen here at this institution. Um, 
the, we had a so-called VIP. I'm sure you've all come across these patients. Extremely non-compliant, does, does everything the way he, he wanted it done. He had metastatic prostate cancer. Refused all, the, all these things, and my poor colleague was, didn't know what to do with this guy. Uh, typically, we do myelograms to identify the spinal cord. He refused that. And so to, uh, 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 in a way, placate the patient, this patient was treated without an accurate uh, est estimation even of where the spinal cord was. He had a bone-only disease, no epidural disease. They didn't do a myelogram. Uh, they didn't do an MRI fusion uh, because he was being difficult. He wanted to be treated right away. So 24 grain, a single fraction, was given, assuming that the spinal cord was in the middle of the fecal sac at T4. So here's the plan. Looks pretty typical for us. Very good coverage. Uh, met all our cord constraints with the assumed spinal cord, uh, cord position. But really, the spinal cord was not in the middle of the spinal canal as it was estimated. As often is the case in the upper thoracic spine, it tends to drape anteriorly according to the curvature of the spine. And in the upper thoracic spine, it usually likes to, uh, to uh, position itself more anteriorly uh, and not in the middle of the fecal sac as it was originally estimated to be. So you, sure enough, you can see on follow-up scans, there's marrow changes on the MRI scan, as you might expect after successful radiosurgery, but this patient also de developed uh, cord signal change on uh, the uh, T2-weighted MRI scan. You can see there's edema uh, on the cord. This is, the one, this is one of those things you just don't want to see uh, in a patient in follow-up. So what happened? Well, in fact, if you look at where the cord was estimated to be compared to where it truly was, there was about a four millimeter differential in the cord position. Does four millimeters really make a difference? Well, it certainly can in the realm of radiosurgery where one or two millimeters can make a difference. Here is a dose volume histogram. A dose volume histogram is a kind of graphical way to show cumulative uh, radiation doses based on the volume of the tissue or the organ or the target compared to uh, traced over the, uh, uh, the dose on the x-axis. So here is in the red what the uh, intended dose of the spinal cord was. And then in green was the actual cal delivered dose. And so there was a significant difference in the maximum dose received by the spinal cord. We typically constrain our spinal cord doses to less than 14 gray as a maximum dose to any point on the spinal cord contour. But this particular case, the maximum dose received was over 21 gray. Certainly, we would say that 21 gray to the spinal cord in a single fraction, you're, you're in tiger country there. Some interesting data from uh, uh, pigs. I think this is really uh, uh, my favorite data set on spinal cord tolerance. This is, I think, a very elegant set of experiments done on uh, mini pigs uh, by Paul Medine at UT Southwestern. Pig, these mini pigs are apparently have the most anatomically similar uh, spinal cord uh, and spine anatomy uh, to the human. And so what he did is he took a series of pigs, did a dose escalation experience using stereotactic radiosurgery techniques, which means it was partial cord irradiation to high doses. It wasn't full cord, it was just partial cord the way it would be for uh, radiosurgery, and then did a dose escalation exercise from 14 gray to, uh, I think it went to 24 gray uh, in a single fraction. And you know, the, the red line represents the, the probability of histopathologic damage. And so uh, what he did is that he took these spinal cords, uh, sacrificed the animals, and, and did a histopathologic analysis to look at the amount of damage that was inflicted from, radios, from the radiation. And uh, the confidence intervals are relatively wide here because he used uh, only three or four pigs per dose level. But 
What comes out, I think, is a very important lesson for us as we pay attention to the details. And that is that the complication probability curve is very, very steep. It starts off really less than 17 gray, zero probability of, of spinal cord injury. But when you get above 21 gray, you're almost absolutely certain to have spinal cord injury. So over a range of about four gray, you go from zero to 100% complication probability. What does that mean to us as clinicians? It means we have to be extremely careful because once you enter into tiger country, you're all in. And a few millimeters can make a difference in dose of 10 to 20 percent to the spinal cord. And so a, a setup error or a mistake in calculation, or there are a number of things that can happen, because this is very complex, uh, a, a, a minor mistake can end up resulting in a catastrophic result. Uh, again, I don't want you to get the wrong idea because we, we know that stereotactic radiosurgery is a very powerful tool to benefit our patients, but just like any other tool, uh, you have to be careful. And we are careful, and because of that, the complication rates from spinal radiosurgery are extremely low, particularly for spinal cord, certainly less than 1% much less than 1%, but it underscores the importance of paying attention to the details. How about even in the re-irradiated setting, this is equally interesting, for spinal cord tolerance in this experiment, Paul took a number of pigs, gave them all 30 grain, 10 fractions, and then a year later repeated dose escalation exercise, and he found that the spinal cord tolerance in pigs who had previously had conventionally fractionated radiation to the whole cord this time, it was a standard uh, technique that he used to give 30 grain, 10 fractions. A year later, then did radiosurgery, absolutely no difference between spinal cord tolerance of pigs who had never been irradiated and pigs who had had radiation with conventional fractionation a year prior. The curves were almost superimposable. But the point here is, that uh, the, uh, the dose where you would have a complication of either a 10% risk or a 90% risk is over an extremely small, short interval. Here are some uh, spinal cord tolerances that various institutions that have a very high volume of radiosurgery would use, and I think it really comes around to about the same thing. We're all uh, focused in on uh, about the same level in terms of what we will accept to the spinal cord. Uh, but, you know, in full disclosure, again, this is not based on any science, really. Uh, but we have found that uh, with these kinds of cord constraints, if you, if you pay attention to the details, that it's extremely safe. And, uh, and that you can achieve much higher levels of tumor control if you, if you uh, follow at least uh, you know, these types of guidelines, uh, the rate of uh, cord complication is extremely low. But it is, if in order to achieve this, you have to be able to work well as a team, uh, uh, with, uh, as radiation oncologists or neurosurgeons, also with medical physicists, uh, and every link in the chain has to be equally robust. Another, we've actually found that the, our biggest complications are actually esophageal. And uh, here's a case of a 45-year-old patient, oligometastatic renal cell carcinoma, got 24 grain, a single fraction, um, and received uh, 15 gray to 2 cc's of the contoured esophagus, and this patient uh, has this type of a dose volume histogram um, and uh, the green contour here or the green line represents the volume, the dose received to volumes of the esophagus. And you can see that especially in the thoracic spine it's very hard to avoid the esophagus with, uh, if your intention is to treat the entire vertebral body, uh, which you know, we would recommend as your clinical target volume. 
And um, in these days when we treated this patient, we weren't fully aware of the potential complications that radiation can cause to the esophagus. We were really focused on sparing the spinal cord. This patient developed esophageal pain, eventually was found to have a non-bleeding ulcer at the level of treatment, and an outside gastroenterologist was worried about it because he wasn't familiar with this type of injury, so he did a forceps biopsy. Uh, worsening pain, increased ulceration and infection, this just didn't heal. Again, the gastroenterologist this time did a dilation and did another forceps biopsy. And then by six and a half months, uh, he developed a tracheal esophageal fistula. You can see there's an attempt to put a stent in there on this CT image here. Uh, underwent multiple repairs and stent procedures. And uh, this patient uh, really could not have systemic therapy in this condition. Uh, and so we're, while the, uh, uh, our on his oncologists are waiting for his, his esophagus to heal so he could get chemotherapy, his disease progressed. And he expired from uh, disease progression. In this case, it's very, um, and it's not very comforting to tell them, you know, you died of metastatic disease, but at least, you know, your thoracic spine disease was okay. <laughs> it's just, it's a hard sell that way. And you, I can't help but think that this poor patient's esophageal problems really led to early demise. And um, we've learned a lot of lessons about esophageal complications with radiosurgery. This is a paper that we published a couple of years ago now where we had seven patients who had, uh, who had grade four or higher esophageal complications, uh, all at, uh, well, not all of them, but most of them at the 24 gray level. But what we found was that uh, there were no uh, serious adverse complications to the esophagus without either uh, anthracycline-based chemotherapy and or iatrogenic um, uh, interventions, particularly biopsies, you know, these kinds of things should be uh, stopped. There's no purpose for it, but you may have uh, uh, outside gastroenterologists who are just not familiar with the effects of radiation on the esophagus. And uh, I think just about anybody who has radiosurgery, if you did do a, uh, an endoscopy, you're going to see mucosal changes. And it's uh, when they get multiple biopsies, uh, uh, especially in combination with anthracycline-based chemotherapy, those patients are really at risk. And I tell all my patients, do not let anybody touch you unless your doctor talks to me first. Um, we feel very strongly about this. Uh, and it was a hard lesson learned. This is another interesting uh, aspect of esophageal dose tolerance, and we created a complication atlas based on all our patients uh, who had radiation uh, uh, really within the levels of the spine where there is esophagus. And we took all their dose volume histograms and piled them on top of each other and created a map. And this is the probability of a, a grade three or higher esophageal complication uh, based upon the volume of the esophagus on the y-axis and the dose on the x-axis. And so if you have part of your dose volume histogram that goes into the red, then ac according to our database, you have nearly 100% likelihood of developing at least the grade three esophageal complication. If your dose volume histogram uh, falls within the darker shades, and then that risk is, is significantly lower. And uh, if your, your uh, dose volume histogram would fall within the green area, so this is 20 gray, by the way, right here, uh, then you have up to a 50% probability of an esophageal complication. So this is just a, a co culmination of our experience mapped against a, a specific complication. So we've also found this type of tool to be very helpful as we assess our, our plans and ask ourselves, what is the risk of a serious complication if I accept this plan for treating this patient? Overall, we found by changing our esophageal, uh, compl our esophageal uh, normal tissue constraints uh, to 14 gray, 
to two and a half cc's, that that seems to be a cutoff. And we made this change about two, I guess about two or three years ago now, and we have not seen a serious esophageal complication since we've made this change. Now you might think that going from, we, our previous limit was 15 gray to two cc's of esophagus, and going to 14 gray to two and a half cc's, could that really make that much of a difference? Well, I'm here to tell you clinically, we have not had a case of grade three or higher esophageal complications since we made this dosimetric change. And um, again, I believe it's paying attention to the details that makes a difference. Compression fracture. Um, I'll probably stop after I talk about this. This is actually probably our most common uh, 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 post-treatment effect that we see. Here's a case of a 63-year-old patient with non-cell cell lung cancer. Uh, who uh, had radiosurgery to T5 and uh, going oh, from October in 2006 to March of 2007, this patient developed acute onset back pain and here you can see that in uh, about, you know, within six months of radiosurgery, this patient has a, a compression fracture that's developed at the site of treatment. I'm just going to quickly go over paper. Uh, it was really the first paper uh, that, is, that addressed th this observation uh, in radiosurgery in the spine uh, for a JCO paper from 2009 uh, looking at 71 patients or 71 lesions treated from 18 gray to 24 gray in a single fraction. And we really follow these patients as if they were on protocol. We image them every three or four, well, I'd say now every three to six months. Uh, and uh, essentially got our best ra neuroradiologists, locked them in a room with three spine surgeons and gave them lots of pizza. Actually, I don't know, was there any pizza there, Mark? <laughs> no pizza, okay. They were faster. <laughs> <laughs> and looking at really is the primary outcome uh, radiographic progression uh, or uh, either of a new fracture or progression of an existing fracture. And then we looked at a bunch of other clinical factors, such as the ASIA score, pain scores, and narcotic use. And what we found was that there was gross radiographic change in almost 40% of our patients who had radiosurgery. And uh, the CT appearance was a significant predictor for uh, uh, vertebral body uh, uh, collapse, uh, where Lytic lesions were, were six times, almost seven times more likely to fracture than either mixed sclerotic lytic or sclerotic lesions. And the percent vertebral body involvement was a significant risk as well. And the more vertebral body that was involved with tumor, the higher the likelihood that your patient was going to, un was going to undergo a compression fracture, either progression of a, of a uh, uh, previous fracture or a new radiographic finding. So I want to stress that these patients are, uh, are uh, we really reported on radiographic changes. Not all these patients are going to become symptomatic. Uh, that T5 lesion, I think, is a little bit of an outlier because most patients who have fractures uh, in the thoracic spine, particularly away from junctional areas, remain minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic, and there's really nothing that needs to be done. It has no impact on their quality of life. We just see it radiographically. However, some patients do become symptomatic. So here is stratified by CT appearance, lytic versus non-lytic. You can see in the dark line, uh, the non-lytic, they tend to fracture later uh, and not as frequently, but uh, follow these patients long enough and the majority of them will demonstrate radiographic changes over time. So um, we're just updating our patients who have had at least five years follow-up following radiosurgery. And I think this, is an, uh, this has been presented as an abstract. Uh, but uh, with patients who have had at least five years of follow-up, again, our results are similar to what we published uh, about over five or six years ago now, which is that of almost 40% radiographic fracture rate about 12% overall required some kind of intervention. 
So about 12% of patients who had radio surgery and have at least five years of follow-up have uh, required some kind of intervention like a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. And that represents about 30% of our radiographic fractures require an intervention. Uh, other pe others have looked at this. Uh, this is from MD Anderson, looking at patients who either had 18 gray in a single fraction, 9 gray times 3, or 6 gray times 5. They found about a 20% risk of compression fracture after SVRT. And uh, in their multivariate analysis, the only significant factors were age greater than 55, a pre existing fracture, or pre existing pain. All other factors, including dose, that did fall out in multivariate analysis. And certainly in our uh, analysis, dose was not a uh, predictive factor, though I know there's a paper that from Toronto where they do feel like the dose of radiation can make a difference. Uh, so we always talk about an in initial presentation with patients the probability of a compression fracture after radiosurgery as a real potential complication, although we believe that ultimately not a significant proportion of those patients will never require any kind of intervention uh, for the fracture. Okay, I've got some other stuff, but I think I'm just going to stop there. I think Dr. Bilski will talk a little bit about the relationship of dose and outcome. So I'm going to stop with that uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, take any questions if there are any.